Uh, welcome everyone. I am Liz Goodrich from Deschutes Public Library. I am part of the community relations team and it's a privilege for me to organize cultural programs where we invite people in to learn a little something new. Um, our theme this month is No Timber and uh, that's why we have invited um, John Marshall here to talk about forests. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce John F. Marshall. He has worked as a freelance photographer with the Pacific Northwest Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service in developing imagery to illustrate landscape change over time. He has an MS degree in wildlife from the University of Idaho, and I think these pictures that you're going to see tonight are going to be mind-blowing. So please welcome John Marshall. Well, thank you, Liz, and um, thank you for everyone that's tuned in and to everyone that uh, checks this um, program out in the future. Um, I'm up here in, in Wenatchee, Washington, but I've been uh, down to Bend very recently. Anyhow, the, uh, the focus for tonight's program is panoramic photographs that were taken in the 1930s from forest uh, lookouts. Um, this one happens to be from the Umpqua, um, so uh, in order to do this uh, project, um, the Forest Service commissioned a special camera to be built, and I think it was like 1932, and there were only 10 cameras made. They were made by Leupold and Volpol in Portland, Oregon, and they were designed by William Osborne, who was a U.S. Forest Service employee. Uh, Osborne is also known for the Osborne Firefinder. Um, and as I said, there are only 10 of these made and there's only two remaining that I'm aware of. Um, the one pictured here is in a museum in Spokane. Um, the camera was operated with a wind-up clock motor uh, you can see this little key right here. It went right there and you wound it up and then you tripped the shutter and the camera actually swung through a 120 degree arc. And the film on the inside of the camera was on these curved rails. So it was really quite an amazing device. It was also very heavy. They weighed about 75 pounds, including the plywood cases. Um, uh, so you got to admire the people that did the work um, of hauling this camera around. Um, so uh, you're probably aware there was a, a lot more fire lookouts back in the day than there are now. Um, most of them have been torn down. Um, this happens to be up in the North Cascades, uh, a place called North 20 Mile. And I've superimposed a picture of the Osborne Firefinder. So with the Osborne Firefinder, the forest lookout could uh, uh, get a bearing, an azimuth, as to where a smoke was. Um, but they also used these photographs that were taken by the Osborne camera uh, as a way of verbally describing where they were seeing smoke because they annotated these pictures in the margins. Um, but the, the main reason why they took all these pictures at every lookout site was that they wanted to have an idea of where they had good coverage and where they didn't. They wanted to know whether they needed to put another lookout on another mountain. And by seeing pictures that had all the views from all the peaks, they knew how they were doing. Um, so that you can see this uh, vehicle says photo survey on it. Um, th there were 813 fire lookout sites in Oregon and Washington um, back in the day. Uh, so that's a lot of lookout sites. Um, so uh, here's a typical Osborne panorama uh, of a very a typical site. Uh, this is Rooster Rock on the Willamette National Forest uh, on the south fork of the Santa Anne River drainage. And you can see this uh, 
you know, there's the, uh, the lookout cabin there and there's a ladder. But if you look at the picture across the top, you see these uh, numbers. Those represent degrees, 180 degrees is due south and 300 degrees is west by northwest, 270 is west. So the pictures had a built-in scale on them uh, that tells you the precise directions. You'll also notice a little line, looks like a power line right in this area. Uh, that isn't a power line, that's called the artificial horizon line, which tells you uh, what is dead level elevation from wherever you happen to be. And then you see uh, notations down at the bottom, uh, where it was taken, what the elevation is. Uh, the plus one plus 15 indicates how high off of the ground it is. And then of course the date. And on a lot of them, there's also a name and wherever possible, I like to credit the names um, today, these pictures are at the National Archives and Records Administration in Seattle. Um, there's 3,105 prints. Um, they vary in quality. Uh, some of them are pretty out of focus or overexposed, but some like this one are just absolutely stellar good. Um, so uh, probably a lot of you people that live in the Bend area uh, travel over uh, the North San Am Highway. And what you see here is a picture taken where Detroit Lake is today. Um, so imagine Detroit Reservoir and then take away the water and move back in time 90 years. This is what you had. That's the North San Am River right there. And you can see it was all burned out. So, um, um, big fire in that area is not something brand new. Um, it's been going on uh, for eons. Uh, we just haven't had it recently, at least west of the Cascades. Um, so how did I get into this? I, I, I got into it because um, I'd always been interested in fire and um, uh, particularly how fire affected wildlife in um, uh, forming habit habitats or destroying habitats. It can go either direction and was interested in what happens over time. And so when we had a big fire in 1994 up on the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest, I, in independent of anyone, um, uh, took photo point pictures with the thought of going back. And I was able to um, enlist the Forest Service in my endeavor. And um, I started out with about 100 sites and there's about 40 sites that I managed to follow through the first 20 years. And I'm kind of hoping that I'll be able to retake all those 40 sites at year 30 which is coming up in three years. Um, this is a site up above the town of Leavenworth and that's a 10 foot boulder that cracked as uh, after the fire and, and the rock was cooling. Um, and so uh, we're able to follow this through time. I think that this was uh, uh, two years later in this photo. Um, and this is probably about five years later. Um, and uh, this is about 10 years later. And finally, we're at um, 2019. Um, so that would be um, uh, 25 years after the fire um, at that site. Um, so here's another one. This is 1994. Uh, and this picture looks a lot like places I just saw two weeks ago down on the Fremont a National Forest uh, that were in the bootleg fire. They look just about like that right now. So this is what those folks have to look forward to. Uh, if you move ahead six years to 2000, you got a lot of grasses back and you got arrowleaf balsam root and bloom. Um, 
uh, it's kind of a hopeful place. Um, so 2010, that's uh, 16 years after the fire. Um, most of the trees have fallen down. Um, and then you get to 2018 uh, and you've got these Douglas firs that are really shooting up. Um, but I'd always worried about this site, what was gonna happen when the next fire came along because there's all this dead and down and green trees growing up through it. And I finally got to find out um, because they lit a prescribed fire. Uh, essentially, it was a bomb waiting to go off and they detonated it on purpose, you might say. Um, you can see that the big tree that's featured in the picture is totally uh, it, there's not much left of it, you know, maybe 10% of the wood is not burned. The rest uh, went up in smoke and in ashes. Um, yeah, there's what remained of that large tree in the first photo. And the soil is rather baked here. When you see that uh, reddish orange color, um, that's from deep penetrating heat. And that's what you get with a log on the ground. Um, so I started by looking at how things happen after fire and rollout, and then um, the Forest Service uh, uh, turned me to another project, which was looking at landscapes over long lengths of time. So the very first um, uh, site I did was uh, near Mission Ridge Ski Area, and here's the photograph from 1934. And I did this in 2010. So uh, what, that's 76 years. Um, and when you look at the differences, particularly in here, this is very open in 1934 and very kind of knitted together in 2010. Um, that's as the result of removing wildfires from the equation of how things work on the landscape. And you can see that it's not a healthy forest, that brown is a Western spruce budworm that's in an epidemic there. Um, so that was my first Osborne panorama. Um, I've been to many places since. Um, some of them have, a few of them, if I'm lucky, actually still have a lookout tower. Uh, this is Leecher Mountain up in um, the Methow Valley still operated. Um, but most of the time there, there's no fire lookout. And, and if I'm lucky, the original site was a cliff top like right here. Um, but uh, very often uh, what I have to do is resort to a drone. And the drone is just a fantastic tool for getting these pictures of, off the ground. Um, the picture quality is not quite what I get out of a, a DSLR camera, but um, actually my latest drone is at least as good for image quality as that huge camera they packed in in the 1930s and weighs a tiny fraction, which is amazing to think about. Um, so, being as how this is Deschutes Library, uh, I thought we'd start by looking at something uh, close to Bend. So what you see here is Lava Butte. Everybody knows Lava Butte. Um, and let's zoom in so we can see what's happened at Lava Butte since 1933. You got to remember that in 1933, there was a lot of heavy logging going on, and uh, they probably already taken the cream of the crop of the big ponderosa pines. Um, but it, was, it never would have been a dense forest like it is today. I mean, you look at this forest today, and, and there's just, it, it hasn't been that way ever. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, it's a, a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, there's just too many trees. Um, so 
Lava Butte certainly interesting and it's worrisome what's uh, happening on the landscape and how things might play out in a future fire. Um, something that's curious, uh, this tree is in uh, the original photograph as a dead snag. I'm gonna back, go off to, back to, there it is as a, as a snag, it was a snag in 1933 and it's still standing, which is um, just kind of mind boggling. Um, I'm just going to kind of take a tour and, and skip around here. Um, this is a place called uh, Table Rock on the, uh, it borders the Malheur and the Wallowa Whitman National Forest and is quite a ways to the east of Bend, more close to the Idaho border. Uh, it's a fire lookout that's still working and um, You've got a solar collector up here, um, kind of a not exactly a 1930s thing. Um, and when you look at, at the comparison, uh, there's a lot of high severity fire that happened about five years ago uh, in this drainage that was is uncharacteristic of what had happened in the past. Um, and too often what's happening is we're flipping from too many trees to too few trees because we're basically getting all of our fire suddenly at all at once instead of spread out over uh, many decades. Um, this is on the Umatilla National Forest. It's the one place called Arbuckle Mountain. It's uh, near Ukiah. And what you see right here is a stand of aspen trees. And this is all mountain big sagebrush. And the Douglas fir trees have just kind of come in here and completely taken over. So that there's very little of this open sagebrush habitat and the, the aspens have been shaded out and are died out and gone. Um, so it's kind of a, big ecological change there. Um, one of the more uh, famous uh, fire lookout sites is of course uh, Hat Point, which is in Willow County, uh, looks across the Snake River into Idaho. Um, amazing place to go. I really urge everybody that can to make the trip. Um, so here's a view from Hat Point. Um, Oh, they had a big fire, I can't remember what year, maybe about 15 years ago that wiped out this forest. Uh, lodgepole pine came back really thick. And then they had a secondary fire that wiped out part of the lodgepole pine reprod, which might sound like a bad thing, but actually it's a good thing because it ate some holes in what would otherwise be just a continuous swath of dense lodgepole. And when the trees came back in here, they're not as dense, that they're gonna be more of a spaced out forest. Um, here we're looking down into the Snake River and Hills Canyon. Uh, and one of the big changes is, uh, I think these are all hardwoods here in the bottom. Uh, probably cottonwood, maybe some aspen, um, um, water birch, uh, some alder, gray alder. They're essentially gone. Uh, they've been replaced by conifers, um, mostly Douglas fir. And that's a result, one, another result of, of just not having any fires uh, right down in there. Actually, there's a lot, been a lot of fire on these hills, but it hasn't cooked out the stream bottom. Um, going up into the Wallowa Mountains, up in the Eagle Cap Wilderness, um, uh, I think a lot of visitors probably think that uh, since a, it's a wilderness area, it's probably as it's always been, uh, and it's not. And the reason is that most fires are put out in wilderness areas. Um, even though in theory, mother nature is supposed to rule, 
um, the Forest Service is worried about the fire getting out of what it'll do outside of wilderness. And a lot of uh, local people are worried about what it'll do outside of wilderness. And so um, unless they think it's gonna run up in the rocks, they're likely to put out the fires uh, in most cases. Um, but look at what a difference uh, is made over what 75 or 80 years. This is going back to, I think it's 1935. And you can see it's a very open meadow. Um, this is McCulley Creek. And you go to the same site today and the trees have just filled in. Uh, that's a result of all that fire suppression work. I'm gonna go back and show you that again. Um, 1935 um, and 2018. And besides the trees getting really dense, the streams have shrunk up because basically every tree acts like a pump that's pulling water out of the ground and having a whole lot of trees on a landscape leaves less groundwater to go into the streams. This is a historic picture from the Oregon Historical Society taken by William L. Finley in 1912 in the High Wallowas. And they're grazing horses on an open meadow. And the thing that you gotta think about is this meadow is perfectly capable of growing trees, but it's not. And so you ask yourself, well, why aren't there trees there? And the answer is fire, that fires kept out the trees from encroaching the meadow. And the fires historically were partly caused by lightning and partly caused by humans because Native Americans saw an advantage to having fire. It meant for better hunting and gathering on the whole. And they lit a lot of fire. Um, now we're up in the uh, up in Washington state again. Um, this is up in the Pesaten Wilderness area. Um, uh, and we had a huge fire there, the Tripod Fire. I, uh, I'm trying to think, it's 2007. A um, lot of it at very high severity. Um, and this is the thing, we're getting our fire in much bigger patches uh, than we did historically. Uh, and it's tilting more towards the high severity that kills most or all trees. Um, fire is actually very good for wildlife, but um, what really matters is having a mixture of green forest and freshly burned and everything in between. Uh, when you just have it painted black or have it painted green, you don't have biodiversity. Um, up in that same area, up near uh, Winthrop, a place called Slate Peak, and you can see the 1934 picture, I think it is, uh, you can see all these patches uh, of forest at different ages due to fires that had come at different times and created a new patch. And then you look at the uh, 2010 picture, and uh, there's, uh, it's all just forested over because uh, there's been little or no fires in that entire drainage. It's, um, it's changed it from a very diverse ecosystem to a simplified one. And the next thing that could happen is that can flip from too many trees, too much forest to too little. That's typically what's happening. So here's another one. Uh, this is a place called uh, Kodak Peak. Um, it's in the Henry M. Jackson Wilderness Area. It's um, north of Stevens Pass, uh, right on the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, and you look at this and at first glance, uh, it, it, it looks like it's the same. Uh, but when you, you dive into it, what you see is a lot of young trees that were not around 
in the 1930s and they're everywhere filling in the meadows. Um, this is another photograph. You can see these copses of uh, mountain hemlock trees and in between all these young trees are establishing and eventually uh, without a fire, it would no longer be a meadow. Um, and I got interested in it and I started uh, probing around in these uh, larger, older trees and I found a lot of fire scarring. Um, this is a fire scar here where the one side of the tree is scorched, but the other side uh, lives and the tree covers over the scorch with, uh, um, it just uh, grows over the, the burned area. Um, so uh, I found a lot of those that indicated that in the past there was a lot of fire in this meadow, but um, not in the last hundred years. So one of the more interesting things that I've done is I got up on uh, a Mount Rainier. Um, a nature conservancy was interested in what was happening to the glaciers up there. And you can see this one right here. This is a Paradise Glacier. It no longer exists. Um, I think this is the Ingram Glacier. Uh, and uh, today it's not as thick. But there's another thing going on, and that is when you look in the 1930s, 1934, you see all this area that was not in forest. It was in meadow and shrubland. It would have been the best huckleberry picking. It had been great for bears. And now it's mostly all forested over, uh, again, inside a national park. So what you see is a change of habitat and a loss of biodiversity due to lack of fire in a national park. Um, going a little south from Mount Rainier now, uh, I, we're south looking back at it. This is a place called McCoy Peak. Um, there were very large fires in this area in 1902 and 1918. Uh, you can see all this burned timber. And um, now you can see what is come back pretty thick most places, but in some places it's struggling. And my guess is it was probably a reburn of a prior fire here that cooked out the soil, like I showed you in that picture earlier, um, logs laying on the ground that burned for days. Um, same place, looking at um, Mount St. Helens. Um, what you see in the 1930s photographs is a lot of fire effects. What you see today is no fire effects, but some clear cutting uh, that happened in the past. Um, Forest Service generally doesn't clear cut anymore, which I'm happy about, um, that you can see the older clear cuts. Um, going a little bit further south uh, in the Mount Adams country, um, this is a place called Red Mountain. There's more than one Red Mountain in former lookout sites. And kind of the same situation. You got a little bit of a fire area here, uh, but on the whole, uh, there just hasn't been fires in this view. <clears throat> on the other hand, if you go over a little bit to the east, there's been fire big time. So again, back to that theme that um, uh, is flipping from too little fire to too much fire. And what you end up with is not having these habitats of freshly burned and, and green forest all intermixed. It's sort of one color or the other. So again, this loss of biodiversity, there's not anything in here that isn't useful to some species, but what's missing is the mix of habitats. Um, coming down to the Columbia River Gorge, um, this is a place called Greenleaf Peak. Uh, Bonneville Dam is right in here. Um, 
course, we had that big, big fire in, I think, 2017. Um, kid lit some fireworks off it went. Um, it isn't entirely a bad thing. Uh, and it's not unprecedented. Here's the same place on the Columbia River uh, near the Cascade Locks in 1867. And guess what? It was a burnt to toast with a lot of snags. And that would have meant good huckleberry picking, a good place for bears, good place for deer, good place for elk. Yet they still had some standing timber. So um, Mount Hood area, um, this is a place called Basin Point that I was at this fall. Uh, you can see the 1934 photograph. Uh, a lot of us burn up. Um, I actually uh, replicated this with a drone. Uh, right there is actually the original uh, original lookout site. And I got up a little bit higher because <clears throat> you couldn't see anything without some more elevation. Um, it's nice to be out in the fall. Vine maple. Um, it's an old insulator. Uh, they ran uh, um, telephone wires. That's how the uh, the lookouts uh, communicated with the um, uh, the people back at the ranger's office uh, where a fire was. And and if you look around where there was lookouts, find, you'll often find wire and insulators. Oops. Um, so same place, looking a different direction. And what you see here is trees that did not burn uh, in the fire that preceded the 1934 picture. And I went into that stand to look at it. It's a pretty open stand. And once again, I discovered fire scars, which indicated that the fire um, burn through the forest without burning it down. Um, and it, I suspect that there was a lot of Native American burning in the area historically, uh, primarily for huckleberry production. Uh, Willamette National Fire Forest, Iron Mountain on the South San Yam. Uh, looks today a lot like it did in uh, the 1930s. A uh, little more open area from burning in the 1930s, but uh, classic old growth forest. Um, I worry for it uh, with our climate change and the big fires we've been getting. A um, little bit further south on the Willamette National Forest, a place called Carpenter Mountain, this is Wolf Rock. Uh, you can see the clear cuts in the photograph. Um, uh, in some ways, clear cuts make some of the same habitat as, as fires uh, because they open the forest to sunlight. Uh, they can be good for berries and deer and um, elk browsing, um, but they're missing the snags component of a natural forest. And uh, they also tend to have more even edges than a fire that's natural. Um, down on the Oregon Coast Range, uh, this is near Walport. And you can see this historic forest, besides having snags, it had a lot of, of deciduous trees. These are either uh, alders or big leaf maples are a mixture. <clears throat> and today there's just a few of the um, uh, deciduous trees left. It's almost entirely conifer trees. So um, this brings us down to the Fremont National Forest. <clears throat> and uh, I was just there two weeks ago. I felt drawn down there because my father had been a fire lookout in um, 1943. 
as a 17 year old boy, he came to this place. And um, one of the more interesting stories he tells about is that as a young single employee, he had to turn all of his food rations um, coupons over to the Forest Service because it was World War II. And they pulled everybody's coupons together to make group meals. Um, kind of an insight of how things were back in the day. I have some video that I really like to show you of um, the Fremont and the bootleg burn, which happened this summer. We've had some technical difficulties uh, and um, I'm gonna kind of leave it up to Liz whether we try it. And maybe what we should do is take questions first and then if we can do the video, it's just kind of a bonus. Um, so Liz, are you there? Can we go to questions? Yeah, um, so John, why don't you go ahead and stop sharing your screen so we can get... Um, Okay, stop okay. share there. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to give people a few minutes to to collect their thoughts. And if you uh, folks out there watching, if you have a question, put those in the Q&A. But I have some questions as okay. I'm watching your presentation. Um, I don't know if you have done much research, but could you talk a little bit about the folks who staffed the Outlooks? Who staffed the what? The outlooks, the fire outlooks. Oh, the lookouts. Yeah, the lookouts. Thank you. Well, I think they were they were a, a real mixture of um, sometimes college kids and um, sometimes uh, locals. That it was just a summer job, and I know one fire lookout that's put in thirty five years, uh, and he's got a couple more to go. Uh, and um, some of them are very friendly folks, and some of them uh, um, really don't want to talk to anybody. Uh, it it varies quite a bit, but at any rate, they've got to be a temperament that they can be alone. And yeah. um, my dad in his memoir said that out of, I think, 10 boys that started as fire lookouts in 1943, he was the only one that finished the summer, uh, and and he was a birder. He was he he became an ornithologist, but the birds kept him entertained. Yeah, uh, well, and I know people. I think you can actually rent out um, lookouts now as like Airbnbs. I I know my you can has done that. Yeah, you can. Uh, there's a lot of lookouts that just aren't being used anymore for their original purpose and uh, the Forest Service rents them out at a very reasonable cost. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I, I am wondering, as I was looking at the, the photographs, the Osborne photographs and your photographs, and I heard you talk a lot about the usefulness of fire in our forests, but I'm, I'm wondering um, if you can put it succinctly, what we can learn from the difference differences between the Osborne photographs and your photographs, what what can we learn about the difference there? Well, uh, <clears throat> we've been trying to uh, exclude fire because uh, for safety reasons and because it burns up our properties and trees are valuable, <clears throat> but it's not working out. Uh, and by uh, putting out fire, we're simply delaying it. Uh, and uh, what happens between fires is the forest is growing more trees and whatever dead material falls down doesn't just rot and go away. We're essentially always building the wood pile bigger. And the longer the time between burning the wood pile, the generally the big, the hotter the fire. And so uh, we're loading up these landscapes with fuels, and then when we do get a fire, it tends to be on the hotter side of things. It tends to be larger and hotter than happened historically when fire was more frequent. Um, and, um, you know, there's things we can do about it, um, thinning and prescribed burning 
uh, and I'm a big advocate of that. And I'm also an advocate of um, letting some wildfires burn. Um, obviously, if it's hot and dry and windy, we want to put them out because they're going to be terrible. But if um, the temperature is more moderate and the humidity is more moderate and there isn't a lot of wind, a lot of cases we'd be better off to let them burn because if we don't, we're just putting it off to a, a windy day. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's I, very I, concerning. It's, it's super interesting, you know, watching fire science and, and forest science really evolve kind of back and forth. It's, it's been really, and I'm not a scientist, but I've certainly followed um, with curiosity how we are learning to realize the role that fire plays in the health of a forest. Yeah, so what um, if you reel back in time to when um, before us Europeans got here, there was a lot of fire happening across the entire continent. Uh, and it was partly lightning and it was partly deliberate by the Native Americans because uh, you had be better berry picking, better root gathering, better seed gathering, basket weaving materials, and animals to hunt. And in simplest terms, if you capture all the light in the tree canopies and the light doesn't get to the ground, then there isn't the light to nurture plants that people eat, that animals eat. Um, the trees have limited utility as a food source. And most of the food sources are at ground level. And so you deprive the ground of light, you're gonna have less food around for animals and for people that hunt animals. Now that's the simplest answer to it. And by um, and fire was the tool that kept the land open historically. We remove it, it closes up, it's shaded in, uh, and it's less productive yeah. for anything but trees. <laughs> right. And um, then the trees get too thick too, because um, the, the, the forest is, uh, has geared itself towards putting out a lot of seedlings. And if you don't remove a lot of the, those little trees by some means, and they grow all up, they end up being sticks that are a foot apart. I've, I've cut down trees that are smaller than my wrist that are 60 years old. And I'm not talking about on a mountaintop either. Uh, so uh, the fire was, has always been a natural force that um, was kind of a check on tree growth. And you remove it in the trees keep growing and reproducing themselves and the limbs that fall out of the trees and land on the ground don't just rot and go away. Yeah, I'm, I'm super curious about what you think. Is there ever going to be like a meeting of the minds, an agreement of the use of or the, the utility of fire? perhaps logging, um, perhaps fire suppression, you know, these ways of managing our forests that are all gonna have to sort of come together for the health and the benefit. I mean, none of them are 100% right. None of them are 100% wrong. And I'm just wondering if you see if there's ever gonna be a, um, a nexus of those things. Well, that would be my hope. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, we we tend to want to kind of live in our own corner and and talk to the people that see things our way. Um, yeah, we we need to from um, both for the forest and ourselves. Uh, and you know, it's one of the kind of why I'm involved in doing this is I want people to understand a problem and how it came about and what we might be able to do about it. Um, I'm certainly an advocate for, uh, as I say, thinning and prescribed burning. Uh, and what I would tell people is that if they care about big ponderosa pine trees or big Douglas fir trees the way I do, then they need to be an advocate for thinning and prescribed burning because 
those trees will go away in a fire if we don't remove a lot of the smaller trees from around them. Um, that it's, it's just, uh, uh, we've got a, a forest that's pretty unnatural. We've made it unnatural. And, um, and now we've got, of course, uh, climate change doubling down on what was the pre-existing problem. Yeah. Well, I really love that attitude of like, you know, all of us have um, something invested in the health of these forests. We might come at it from a different angle or a different lens, but um, I think our agreed objective uh, are healthier forests. Um, yeah. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you, John, right now to try to show that video because it's awesome. Okay. Um, for everybody who's, who's still with us. If you want to hang out and give us a little bit of time so John can show this, I, I was able to see this video um, last week, and I think it's really interesting. Um, uh, look at the bootleg fire that you know happened very near us, um, and we all kind of lived through. And we'll we'll give you a couple of minutes to work it out, John. And if we can't, we'll just end the the webinar here. Okay, so I'm going to click the green share screen button, right? Yes. Okay, share screen, and I'm going to go, um, see, I'm going to click on advanced, and I'm going to click on video. Oh, it's going to work. <laughs> Yay. Optimize full screen. How's that? You're, you're good. You can go ahead and start okay, it. Okay, I'm going to start as you it. Have. Okay, so, um, I'm illustrating this first part of this uh, video from down on the Fremont um, in the bootleg fire is when a tornado happened. And uh, there was actually several fire tornadoes, but this one didn't happen on a particularly windy or hot day. Uh, the cause of it was this very, very dense patch of uh, lodgepole pine with a lot of dead and down. And the fire got going so hot in that lodgepole <clears throat> that it formed this tornado. It skipped right over this sagebrush flat that you see here. Um, and it touched down over there. Uh, we'll get there in a bit. So, um, oh, this is all drone video, by the way, of course. Um, we're north of Bly, Oregon on the Fremont Wynema uh, bootleg fire. And now you can see all these trees that were laid over by the tornado. And the trees that didn't get laid over by the tornado got basically scorched and killed by the heat in the cloud generated by the tornado. Probably a lot of volatilized gases that were maybe um, um, burning in the air as they landed. Um, there is my guide, a uh, Forest Service guy named uh, Travis. Um, so <clears throat> not all the outcomes were bad down there. This shows an outcome where <clears throat> it was thinned and prescribed burning done um, prior to the bootleg fire. And the background was not treated. This is the part where they hadn't done any thinning or prescribed burning. This is the part where they did thinning and prescribed burning. So you can see what the difference is in outcome. And this is another area that they had, uh, they done prescribed burning 2018 and 2019. Um, and you can see it just looks like the bootleg fire did nothing to it. It's because they had made it ready for fire um, by putting it back more into what would have been a historical condition. Um, most of these, some of these little trees won't live and that's fine. Don't need them all. 
most of the big trees will live. Um, there could be some uh, bark beetle problems uh, next year, but uh, on the whole, uh, this area is going to be fine. Um, this is now near Sycan Marsh, and this is, we got treated and untreated. Nothing was done here. This was prescribed burned, thinned and prescribed burned. You can see the difference in the outcome. This was not treated, it wasn't thin, it wasn't prescribed burned. And then you get into here and they'd done the thinning and prescribed burning. So that's it for the video. Let's see if I can get back to <laughs> where I need to be. Um, that that was something. So when you say treated and um, thinned, what is treated when you say treated? Tre I'm sorry, treated. Treated means thinning, uh, followed by a prescribed fire. And the thinning, there's sort of two categories of thinning. One is cutting trees that are too small to be merchantable, and just piling them up and burning uh, in piles. The other is cutting down. Uh, trees that are merchantable, but obviously not taking all of the trees. And um, so that some logs are being sold, uh, that would be commercial thinning. And then the burning has two forms. One is, is putting um, slash limbs, treetops in a pile and burning it. The other is what's called under burning or prescribed fire. And that's basically where you have people go with torches in the woods and uh, systematically light up the woods on a carefully chosen day. Um, that would be the under burning. Thank you. Can you stop sharing your screen, John? Yeah, okay, there we go. All right. <laughs> um, I mean, when you said treated, I just automatically thought like, oh, there are chemicals out there, but obviously treated doesn't mean that. No. No. Um, so we had just one thing come in through the chat from um, Roger. Hi, Roger. Um, and he just, it, this is just a comment. He says, it is pejorative, unproductive, and incorrect to argue that one cannot love big trees and question the wisdom of thinning and prescribed burns. <laughs> Would you read that again? <laughs> sure. Um, it is pejorative, unproductive, and incorrect to argue that one cannot love big trees and question the wisdom of thinning and prescribed burns. So I oh. think Rogers okay. made the point that it takes um, a lot of different approaches to, to making our forests healthy. Well, I just uh, have seen too many big trees go away in fires because of the dense thickets of little trees that are around them. And um, uh, I find it um, very sad as I love these big pines. Yeah, and I, I just want one thing before we sign off. Um, and John, really, thank you so much for your art, beautiful photographs, and your real love of the forest and understanding and being able to explain um, what we've seen historically uh, and what we might unfortunately see in our future regarding our, our forest health. But one thing you said that really captured my attention was that it's important to make our forests ready for fire. Yeah. And I, I think that is just such a beautiful way to put it. Like we can help prepare um, our forests to withstand these, these, these fires. Fire doesn't have to be a bad outcome. Uh, and um, the fuels on the land uh, have a lot to do with what that outcome is, as I just showed you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, those, those, that drone footage was really striking. Um, so any last questions? We'll just give a couple of, just a little bit more. Anybody you, you want to thank tonight, um, John, for your, your work? Any, anybody you want to acknowledge tonight? Well, I mean, uh, th there's, there's actually a, a lot of uh, people along the way that have helped me. And I might start by thanking the guys that took the pictures back in the day. Uh, 
I can thank the National Archives in Seattle for taking care of the pictures. Um, um, lots of people in the Forest Service have helped me over the years. Um, I've been um, uh, helped by Loa Resources uh, in um, Northeast Oregon as a sponsor for a lot of the panoramas that I've taken. And um, a number of individuals that have, that have donated uh, to the cause. Uh, yes. So yeah, lots of people. Thank um, you. I see a little box on mine that says chat with three, uh, number three on it. Are, are, have we heard from all those people? Have we? Yeah, the, the, the first two were just me asking people to put in questions. And the third was um, Roger's really lovely um, statement about loving trees um, in lots of different ways. Okay. So um, everybody who's on the call tonight, you're going to get a, um, a link to fill out a survey. We hope you will take a, a minute or two. And um, John, you're welcome to come down to Bend and to <laughs> explore um, the Deschutes National Forest anytime. We would love to see you in person. Um, and thank you so much for your time and your real care of this wonderful natural resource that we have, that we are living, living with. It's our heritage. Thank you. Uh, it yep. really is. Yes. Yep. And thank you, Liz. Thanks for yep. for having me. Um, thanks for all who who watched. Yep. Yeah. And I'll end the webinar here. So, John, thank you so much, and um, we will see you uh, hopefully in person soon. Okay. Bye, bye, Liz. All right. Thanks. Thank you.